New York City is one of the most expensive places to live in America. Will they ever build more housing? This week's episode is another episode in our state-by-state -state housing series, and we're talking about housing in New York. Joining me are Alex Armlovich and Rachel Fee. Alex Armlovich is the Senior Housing Policy Analyst at the Niskanen Center, and Rachel Fee is the Executive Director of the New York Housing Conference. And together, we spend this episode trying to answer questions like, why housing reform has failed thus far in New York? What specific regulations and factors make it hard to build housing in New York? And what political coalitions will be necessary for New York to finally pass laws that allow us to build more housing. We always appreciate if you can drop us a like, a comment, subscribe for the podcast. And if you want to support us even more, you can do so at patreon.com slash neoliberal podcast. You can also support us by becoming a member of the Center for New Liberalism. You can do that at cnliberalism.org slash become a member. Thank you, everyone who supports us, and enjoy the episode. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the New Liberal Podcast, part of the Center for New Liberalism. I'm your host, Jeremiah Johnson, and joining me this episode are Rachel Fee and Alex Armlovich. Rachel and Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. So I think the first thing we should do for those of us who are not New Yorkers, the listeners out there, because all three of us are, are New Yorkers, we live in New York City, but not everybody does. I know it's shocking that there are people outside of New York City. I, I learned this <laughs> recently, but we should describe kind of where we are. We've done this podcast a bunch of times and kind of the first time I, I asked this to like the California and Montana people, which is where we've done this kind of state by state thing before. I'm just trying to get a picture of like what's going on. So what is the state of housing politics in New York right now? Do we have enough housing? Are there big housing bills that have been proposed or have they succeeded? Have they failed? Can you give us like the, the 10,000 foot view of the current situation? Sure, I can jump in and start. Um, so we have just ended a session in Albany where um, our New York State Governor Hochul proposed um, a truly ambitious um, housing plan to include growth targets across the state, um, mandating transit-oriented development, um, a, a host of other policy changes that would um, expand our housing supply by up to 800 800,000 units over the next decade. So it was really the set of policies New York needs to solve our housing crisis um, it, with a, a long-term growth framework. And that, uh, that proposal was met with fierce resistance by the legislature. And we ended session with virtually nothing happening on housing. So it was um, a big proposal, a very disappointing come down, and now we're kind of uh, licking our wounds and figuring out, um, you know, what is a, a second attempt at this look like? Um, what what is needed for strategy, for outreach, for education, for coalition building, and and how do we move forward with statewide action on zoning and housing supply? Yeah. I, I fully agree with that, that, that take on, on where we're at. And, um, we, you know, we're in a situation where New York state has been losing population. And, um, in terms of like in tax based terms, you know, the, uh, amount of, uh, uh, taxable income subject to New York state income tax has, you know, been, uh, there's a large movement to the Sun Belt during COVID. Part of that is remote work, but part of that is also just, you know, responding to, uh, you know, housing is really, really expensive and scarce downstate where there's good jobs and, you know, good, good urban amenities. Um, and uh, even upstate, you're seeing tighter housing markets. The, the, the rental vacancy rate in Rochester, New York is shockingly low. They, they went below 5%, uh, uh, you know, post-COVID. Uh, and so 
really kind of across the state, you're seeing the housing squeeze affecting the population of the tax base. And then uh, there's even another unique problem downstate. We uh, allowed our uh, tax exemption on the new construction of housing to expire. And so uh, while that's in limbo, uh, permits have tanked in New York City. Um, so it's, it's, the situation is going to get worse before it gets better. That's so interesting to hear about upstate because, again, I'm, I'm a very stereotypical New Yorker at this point in that I just don't ever think about upstate. But, you know, I, you're right in that upstate plays a large role in the state legislature and in electing the governor, obviously. And they are also having a housing crunch. And so I guess that leads into my next question, which is, are there any special factors that we need to consider when we talk about the housing crisis in New York? Because there's a lot of places all around the country that are having kind of the same problem. There's housing crisis everywhere. Rent is too expensive in a lot of places. But, you know, New Yorkers tend to think that New York is special and and we're unique and, you know, no other places like us. And I wonder if that also applies to, to our housing crisis. Is it different in any important way than other states? So New York City in particular has been struggling with an affordability crisis for decades. Uh, New Yorkers, New York renters have extreme rent burdens. We have the second largest uh, population of people experiencing homelessness in the U.S. And it just seems like rents keep climbing up and um, as does our, our homeless population. So, you know, we've struggled with this um, issue for decades as a high cost city and in demand city because we have the jobs, we're a cultural capital. Um, but I feel like what's changed is the pandemic. Since the COVID crisis, there has been, um, I think, a real awareness of how important it is um, to be housed, to have housing, to have access to housing. But we've also, as a city, um, changed so much in how we're living. So um, I think one of the things that's happening is, you know, we did during the pandemic see a lot of high income New Yorkers uh, flee New York City for a, a brief period. And in that period, rent in Manhattan dropped about 38%. And it was for, you know, maybe between uh, spring of 2020 and spring of 2021. It was a short period, but it really showed us that supply and demand are a thing, even in New York City, on, on the housing front. I and completely then, agree. Completely. We, exactly and, right. Yeah. And then we saw, you know, all these people want to move back into New York City. We saw outdoor dining and, you know, um, action in our streets again. And it, it was a, the vibrant place that that people wanted to be. Yeah. And I, I think it's just to jump in because I agree with you as well. I think it's underrated by people who are not in New York how bad COVID got in New York and how fast. Because like New York was the first place, if you think all the way back to like early 2020, it was the first place in America that really had like bad COVID and like it was weird. It like New York turned into a ghost town. You could walk down the middle of like avenues in Manhattan and just nobody would be there. Like, right. like a zombie and, movie. And and very quickly the housing market responded. You saw um concessions, two months free rent to move in, um, you know, additional amenities, two year leases, like all of these things that were unheard of for, you know, New York renters. And then by the spring of 2021, that changed. People were moving back and immediately the rents went up and they've kept going up. Um, so I think in this period as well, we've also seen um, a staffing shortage, which has impacted not just New York City, but the suburbs as well. And um, not only could uh, companies not attract or retain workers, um, the workers were saying they couldn't afford to live near their jobs. So we were seeing this impact businesses in the New York City suburbs. Another impact was in the Hudson Valley. We saw a lot of um, high income New Yorkers buying a second home in the Hudson Valley. They couldn't afford one maybe in Brooklyn, but they could rent in Brooklyn and, and afford an upstate house. So we saw rent in places like Kingston um, skyrocketing and also local workers there not having housing options. So 
uh, so many changes came out of COVID. We saw, um, I think also the opportunities on the real estate side. Uh, first, it was um, hotels. Um, there was a, a big push to convert hotels to housing. We saw California was successful in doing this. And, you know, we just couldn't get um, the buy-in from our electeds to um, take action and make the regulatory changes in time. So we kind of missed that market. But now we're looking at uh, really serious vacancies on um, the office spaces. A lot of New Yorkers are choosing to continue to work at home a few days a week at least. And we're seeing occupancy rates on offices plummet. So I think it's a mix now of rents are rising, house prices are rising. Um, there's a clear link that we need more supply. Um, but also there's this kind of potential opportunity to add supply um, in some of this, um, what I think is going to be very soon, distressed commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of changes happening at the same time. And I, I do think our housing crisis isn't anything new, but there's more awareness that as a state, we have a supply shortage and we need to take action. There's a couple really interesting ideas in there. And like, yeah, I totally agree that like one of the interesting things that COVID showed is that like supply and demand still exist. You know, if if the demand lessens, you are going to see the prices go down. And and we, we hope the same thing is true about supply. I do think there's also some interesting like New York specific stuff, the, the commercial real estate uh, collapse and and subsequent kind of like, can we switch this into being you know, converted into housing. I think that's a pretty unique New York factor. Wow, that sounds like a um one of those tongue twisters. Unique New York. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but um, I, I, one other thing that I'm curious about, and Alex, maybe you have a point of view on the kind of commercial uh revi the the switch from commercial to housing in terms of like revitalizing some of those properties. But sometimes you'll hear people say that like, well, new you know, New York is expensive because it's full. You know, maybe these other places in the country have all this single family zoning and they have all this wide open space, but like New York is just full, you know, no wonder it's expensive. And do you give any credence to that at all? Is there any sense in which New York is full or? No, I mean, certainly Manhattan has 800,000 people fewer than it had in, uh, you know, in 1930. Uh, and so it's definitely not the case that Manhattan is at its fullest ever. Um, and, uh, I, I wanted to, to, to zoom in specifically again, like the fact that, that, um, so co that the COVID thing, it's, uh, supply and demand. Yes. And specifically the vacancy rate, the fact that we saw it so dynamically and quickly respond. We usually talk about how these things are slow. It actually can be really, really fast. Construction can be slow. It can take a long time to build enough units to get the vacancy rate up. But when you build enough to get the vacancy rate up, rents start, rents start responding immediately. And, and, and so that is, I think, just absolutely a fascinating thing. Again, just wanted to elevate that again. Um, with, with respect to, you know, all commercial office, one big issue we're having is that, um, you know, Manhattan office hasn't fully revalued yet. Like the prices haven't come down enough. Um, and so, you know, I was looking at, uh, you know, it, it basically, the last time something like this happened was when manufacturing left Manhattan, um, you know, after the port moved to New Jersey in the middle of the 20th century. So in the 1960s, people just started moving into these old factory loft buildings in Soho. They were zoned for manufacturing. They were factories. But artists would just kind of do this gray market, live work thing, and the landlord would look the other way. And, you know, uh, after about 10 years of that movement growing, they organized uh, the tenants to, to, you know, to legalize this as an actual way of, of, of living in, in these loft buildings. Um, and... Uh, you know, I was looking at like, okay, you know, what, what would it be like if you were to do that today? Like, what if you're an artist who was really ambitious and you wanted to try one of these live work spaces in some classy office building? Well, classy office rents in New York are still around as high as class A office rents in Houston. And, you know, so in like the low 30s a square foot, that's, in, you know, in terms of the CoStar data. So like until we see, until we see um, like, you know, sharper price movement, um, a lot, you know, a lot of office landlords, people say that they're constrained by some bond covenant language that, uh, it, you know, the, the, the debt on the building, you know, is basically limiting price discovery. Um, to the extent that's true, that's a problem we're going to have to address. But uh, yeah, I'm 
I'm, I'm, I'm more worried about other cities that don't have room for rents to come down. You know, the fact that Manhattan office rents had been so elevated for so long, class A rents were double Houston class, uh, class A, you know, for a comparable, very nice tower downtown. And, uh, you know, a correction is in order and will actually improve the competitiveness, competitiveness of New York. But nonetheless, we absolutely, like the state legislature should be legalizing conversion of office to housing because that's another way that we can help both of these problems at once. All right. So one thing I want to talk about, because I feel like this is different in every state and it's normally a similar kind of thing, but it always has its its own unique little wrinkles, is precisely what the barriers are to housing in New York. Why can't we build more housing? And why for like decades now have we not been able to build enough housing? Because this is really a problem that goes back at, at minimum to the 90s and, and maybe even a little earlier than that, that we just have not built much volume of housing. And, you know, sometimes people talk about different things. And in, in some states, people focus on zoning and it's, it's single family zoning. You know, New York, I think, has a, a little bit of that if you get way out into, into the further reaches of Brooklyn and Queens. But most of New York City is not single family zoning. You know, other places, you know, talk about parking requirements. Other places talk about that developments are not by right. They need council approval. Some places talk about like really burdensome community input hearings or environmental review requirements. And so I'm curious for you guys, what do you actually think like specifically are the, the root causes for why we can't build enough in New York? Is it is it the process that takes too long? Is it particular building requirements like floor area ratio and parking requirements and things mm -hmm. like that? Like what is the actual – or if and if it's not just one thing, what are the core problems that we have to address? I'm, I'm happy to yeah take a crack at that. Um, the uh, it's definitely the case. What's interesting is New York's by right zoning. When a when you uh, when you have the zoning to do a project, it's basically a pretty good process. You're able to get that entitled. It's not subject to a bunch of discretionary review uh, like you see in some West Coast crisis states. Um, the issue is that the current level of by right zoning was set by a down zoning in 1961. It's actually citywide. They lowered the amount of development capacity of the whole city. Um, and so what you can do, you can do by right, but it's basically, it's like a, it's like a straight jacket that was laid over the amount of uh, development that was in place at the time with only some capacity above that. And so like we have by right zoning, but it's too tight. And then also, as you said, parking requirements. It's ironic that New York has the greatest mass transit system. Then we also have relatively restrictive, you know, uh, you know, a dozen cities have have abolished parking requirements. We, you know, we, we've we've lifted them for non-market units near transit in New York, but that's it. Um, and so it's you know, it's it's abs that's absolutely another barrier. Environmental review. We're not I'm, as bad. Go ahead. I'm curious. I'm curious if you know, just because you said by transit, like what in New York counts as not by transit? It's the subway, unfortunately. It's the uh, the subway walkshed. Is it Rachel's at a half mile? Um, I, I believe so. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, even if even if you count just like within a half mile of of a subway, that's that's a pretty huge chunk of the city. Like that's oh yeah. So like Manhattan. So again, but market rate units are still subject to the requirement. Um, so in other words, like the not like any any subsidized unit. Uh, so like that was something that we did do in 2016 that was a nice change, um, uh, at least for the non-market components of any development. But but it's still in place for any market rate buildings uh, or, or units in a mixed income building. Um, and again, uh, in the outer boroughs, there's large areas that are more than a half mile from the subway. Um, but so what so just to sum up, what you're saying is basically New York actually has by right zoning. But it's just so. But it's too tight. It's, it's too tight, and so in order, in a practical sense, to build anything, you've always got to be asking for exemptions, and that means you have to go through the discretionary process. That's right. You're gonna you're gonna ask for a variance, and then you're going to have to negotiate with the local council person, the community board. Um, depending on what you're building, it could also be you know labor. Um, Right. There's a, a host of um, interests now that want to be involved in what the project looks like, who's going to live there, <laughs> what you're getting out of it. 
So it, it becomes a much more um, complicated and long and drawn out process. But I think what's difficult also in New York, um, for example, we have mandatory inclusionary housing in New York City, um, which is great and is adding density. And um, in exchange for that is bringing affordable housing into high income neighborhoods where it otherwise wouldn't get built. Um, but it's set up in a process where the council member um, is really empowered to um, change the terms of the program, um, try to extract as much affordable housing as possible, which is awesome. But sometimes that goes too far or isn't practical um, in terms of what a project can support or even the amount of time that a project is delayed in adding on those complicated negotiations. So like Alex is saying, we have as of right zoning, but we often see projects getting you know, played out publicly. Exactly. So I, I, I live, um, I'm going to tell a story and you guys have probably heard of this project before. And m maybe my listeners, if they've listened to previous episodes, have heard this story before as well. But I live two blocks from something that's known as the Lirio. Are, are you guys familiar with the Lirio? I don't know if I know the story, but maybe I'll recognize it once you tell it. The Lirio is, uh, had traces its roots back to 2003 when Michael Bloomberg said, hey, we should upzone a lot of the city and build some stuff. And it took them six years to settle on a site in Hell's Kitchen for um, a, a housing project. And this is going to be publicly built with public funds. And it was uh, it's on an MTA parking lot. The, the current site is just land owned by the MTA, uh, the, which is our transit system mm -hmm. for listeners. And it's just a parking lot right now. And so they decided on this site in 2009. In 2023... They finally approved the permit for it 14 years later. And the week before, <laughs> the week before they approved the permit, there were still people writing into like our local Hell's Kitchen paper saying, you know, there hasn't been enough c community consultation. We haven't gotten all the promises we want, you know, and we're talking about stuff like, well, they guaranteed low income housing, but they haven't guaranteed enough middle income housing. And you know, it, because this is a, a very big gay neighborhood, they they gave um, preference to HIV positive people, but they didn't guarantee a number of spots for HIV positive people. And like, it, it was 14 years later, it was 2023. And they were still arguing that like, we need to keep doing this. And and like, here we are, the, the, the site still is not broken ground. Um, technically, it's been approved now. But that was like six months ago, and it's still they still have not done anything. It's still a parking lot. So supposedly it will be, it will be built by next year. Um, I expect to die without it ever having been built. But I think it just it it talks about what you were talking about, uh, Rachel, with just the process and and how it drags out sometimes. Yeah, and sadly, that's not a surprising story. And I, I think we could think of um, similar projects who've had mm -hmm. that drawn out fate in, in each and every borough. So um, I do think um, community opposition continues to be an ongoing problem, whether that's masked in you know a call for 100% affordable on a market rate site, which isn't feasible, or if it's, you know, just the typical not in my backyard um, kind of vibe we're getting at community meetings, you know, it continues to be an issue. Um, but I feel like the irony there is that New Yorkers, you know, are always saying like, we want more affordable housing, um, right? It's just not in my neighborhood. And, and that's really, I think, um, Kind of transfers over to what we saw in Albany this year as well. So, um, you know, we started earlier talking about the governor's housing plan and um, the legislature, um, you know, really uh, opposing it in, in very strong ways, especially in Long Island. But, you know, I met with um, members of the legislature, the assembly, the Senate um, from Long Island, from Westchester, Hudson Valley, New York City. And Republican or Democrat, every single legislator starts a conversation with, 
we know we have a housing crisis, we know something has to be done. Um, it's just agreeing on, you know, what has to be done. That's where our work is, um, building consensus towards the solutions. Rachel, I'm really curious, especially about you know, your meetings with the Long Island and, and some of the similar uh, legislators, because Long Island is kind of like New York's NIMBY capital, at least as I perceive it, and, and some of the most NIMBY areas in the country, maybe. And, you know, when I think about this, I'm trying to piece together what are the actual coalitions? Like, what are the political groups? And whether it's, you know, a political party or just an organizing group or a particular type of person who opposes this and like how do we win them over and i imagine these these legislators are basically just responding to their constituents they're kind of doing what le- what legislators should do in some sense in that they can look out and see well i'm getting a 100 calls that are really angry about this thing and so i'm going to get crucified if i vote for this zoning change and so i'm not going to do it in your experience, is it kind of as simple as that, that they're just doing what they hear from their very loud, nimby constituents? I'm not sure it's as simple as that. I, I do think um, the governor's proposal was so big and so bold that there was a knee-jerk reaction of, we have to stop this, not a kind of process of, how do we negotiate a proposal that um, will bring us some solutions that will work for us. So I think part of that was that there just wasn't enough time to socialize the proposal. There hadn't been enough um, you know, groundwork to really get legislators on board or even enough time for them to understand the impact. So you know, while that knee-jerk reaction was um, pretty harsh and very fierce, um, I, I do think there can be softening over time with more outreach, more um, discussion on, on solutions that, that will work for communities. I think in Long Island in particular, I feel like a lot of our conversations um, came to infrastructure capacity, sewers in particular, um, and sort of, you know, looking at what was proposed in, in the budget that accompanied the, the zoning actions is, is really inadequate. And, um, you know, I think, I think that's a real issue. Um, I think for other localities, you know, they don't even have capacity to take on planning. Um, they, they just don't have staff that are, um, you know, a- equipped to make zoning changes, analyze them. And, and I think for the, for the legislators, um, they were hearing from the local electeds, they were hearing from their constituents, but there was just kind of a knee jerk reaction of this is too big. This is too bold. Like we have to shut it down. But I do think there is an openness, um, you know, to pull, to, to pull apart some of the elements here and, and look at how we can propose policies that, that will work. Yeah. I- I think that like the my my you know I think it's ironic that people basically respond to like but the housing compact but that's big enough to solve the problem we can't do that it's like why don't you pick something small that won't solve the problem and it's like okay well great um, but now we do need to do incrementalism because that's you know the way we're going to get there but I would also echo something Rachel said on the um, like the time for legislators to get used to this like. Many legislators were aware that like housing is expensive. Uh, I don't know if necessarily all of them uh, came in with a great understanding of the exact detail, but like 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 Rachel said, many people did you know express knowledge of some that there's a problem. But um, the idea that state legislators hold the constitutional power of local zoning and that it is a delegated power that is you know granted at the pleasure of the state to localities, I think that was a very new idea to many legislators. Um, who kind of just assumed that it was always a local thing, but it's like, um, no, it really is like the state grants it to localities and can impose guardrails on that grant to make sure that those planning powers are used appropriately. I think also, I think it's really important to remember that when you take action that forces um, a locality to act, you are 
you know, taking away from that local elected whatever power um, they feel they have over, you know, I influencing a project. And that doesn't, that's not just rejecting the project, right? That's also, um, you know, a negotiating tool that they have. So, you know, I think it's interesting to think about um, how to make sure that we can build support from local electeds, but that they don't feel alienated in the process either. And I think especially for um, the New York City Council members who have been very much empowered by the mandatory inclusionary housing program, um, there's going to be, you know, I think a, a tough fight for them to kind of give up um, what they perceive as that negotiating upper hand. I, yeah, I, I think that that's a fair point. I think that we have a model in New Rochelle on how to pre-negotiate uh, New Rochelle basically formed a, uh, a downtown overlay zone that had impact fees for fa basic public services um, and uh, and laid out basically a form a form based you know rule for where you know what the shape of the buildings would be but then the details of like what mix of office retail and housing you know was was still pretty flexible and um, and so they basically pre negotiated and then it was. Those negotiations, then, you know, a developer came to the table knowing what they were going to have to pay to the city to get it done. Um, and I think too much discretion actually can breed corruption. I, you know, I, of course, would never impugn any New York politician. But I know in Chicago and in Los Angeles, <laughs> that member that member privilege, like there is a stream of electeds going to jail out of Los Angeles. I, I give you full permission to impugn as many politicians as you want. <laughs> and, and so, I mean, obviously, you know, at, in, in New York State, it's been more at the at the legislative level. You know, we had the we had you know the leader of the Senate, the leader of the Assembly, but both have gone to jail in recent memory. But uh, you know, that those were not those are not strictly housing related uh, mm -hmm. discretion uh, cases. But yeah, in other words, there's appropriate discretion, um, and I think that like it's a political challenge. But you know, policy wise, you want just the right amount of discretion. Yeah, I've. Look, the, the the whole Lirio experience and following that for the, the 12 years that I've lived in the city has uh, has kind of radicalized me against discretionary anything. And I'm probably off the deep end on that one where I'm just like, you know, everybody by ride everything. You know, may, maybe there's some role for discretionary, but but I'm I'm certainly one of the people who's just who's tired of it. I, I think the point I was trying to make is that taking that power away from local elected is not easy <laughs> and that this is part it's not just that they're scared of state policy that's going to force um adding housing it's also that they see that they feel or they you know that they will result in um having less of a role in this or that their negotiating power is reduced and i think trying to um, figure out how to get support locally is going to be really important because this is actually a tricky dynamic. Yeah. And I think that we see in New York City, um, you know, a host of neighborhoods that are building no new housing at all. Um, you know, when we look just at where affordable housing is being built, it's being built in the lowest income neighborhoods or it's being built in high income neighborhoods with MIH and a tax incentive. But, you know, a lot of New York City just um, doesn't see um, this as a responsibility for them to say yes to housing. Or, you know, we have some neighborhoods that are just not zoned with the, the density um, needed right now, but they're going to do everything they can to keep it that way. So I think it's just important to figure out um, how we build supporters um, to kind of show that, you know, maybe you're going to have um, a reduced role in approving every single project. However, um, your, you know, neighboring community that's building no housing at all will be forced to build some, right? Like there is a benefit to that as well. So I'm just kind of pointing out that this is... Um, I think a, a tricky area that we have to overcome um, yeah, for sure. to build support. Yeah, and and look, the 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 part of me that doesn't have to deal with politics day to day 
wants to just tell people like, oh, you're going to have a, a reduced role in deciding what which housing gets to be built where. Good. But but obviously that's not an answer, because if you just say that, you know, people are hesitant to give up power once they've got it. So so it's uh, it's a fair point, And I take it. There was another idea, though, that I wanted to ask about um, it, that, you know, you mentioned at one point that this was a very new thing for many of the uh, state legislatures that or the, the state legislators that, you know, they're, they're not used to thinking of themselves as having this power or that, you know, they kind of knew there was a, a housing crisis, but the, the scale of, of Kathy Hochul's proposal really shocked them or maybe shocked their constituents. And all of that kind of speaks to me as like, well, this is the first big effort that I think we've really had, the, the first big honest effort at like a real solution to the problem. And I, I, I look at the, what other states have done. And, you know, there, there's some states where things went really well right away, like in Montana, for weird idiosyncratic Montanan reasons, they kind of got it all passed in their first go through, like they got a lot of stuff passed almost right away. But, you know, in a state like California, which is probably more similar to New York, it's a big state, it's an urban state, it's very, you know, democratic leaning. You know, it took them two or three tries, you know, when Scott Weiner introduced his first big bill, it, it failed pretty spectacularly a few years ago. But he just came back and he proposed something very similar the next year, and something similar the next year. And eventually, they started to pass a bunch of things. And now they've had all these successes. And so I guess my question here is, do you think it was inevitable that this first one was going to fail? Like, is this just part of the process that we have to go through that, like, we failed and we learned and hopefully we'll get a better package next year? After seeing, uh, like, my, my view that it was that the structural, uh, the structural uh, barriers to a, an omnibus approach in a state like like New York or California, as you said, from 2018. Um, I, my, my sense that this was, I don't want to say inevitable, but the, the sense that it would have been very hard for it to come out otherwise is that in Colorado, they tried the same thing. And the governor there, you know, Governor Polis is the most popular figure in, in Colorado politics. He reached out to the state legislature early. He got the nimbiest mayor in his state, the mayor of Boulder, Colorado, on board before he announced the plan. And then it ultimately still wasn't able to get to a deal in that in a you know in a pretty quick timeline. It's like giving me the sense that yeah, it, it you know there are things we need to do differently, but also you know the structural barriers are, are pretty high. And so maybe the California approach of 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 incrementalism and disaggregating uh, chunks of reform to try to navigate around specific blocking coalitions for any one thing, you know, separating TOD from um, accessory dwelling units. Or, or maybe even doing TOD in New York City, you know, first, and then coming back and doing TOD in the suburbs, second, you know, finding ways to unbundle them to unlock some of these coalitions. I think it's also worth mentioning that um, there is a lot of energy around housing in the legislature. It's been focused on affordable housing and focused on tenant rights. So um, we've in Two years ago, we doubled housing investment in our statewide affordable housing plan. Um, it's, you know, one of the biggest in the country. And in 2019, the tenant advocates had an enormous win um, on bringing, you know, a housing stability, a greater tenant protections to our, our rent stabilized stock impacting um, a, about a million apartments in New York City. So the legislature is used to dealing with housing. Um, they are interested in housing as an issue. They um, really want to see more affordability downstate, but across the state. So I do think, you know, now focusing on zoning is really the next phase. Um, you know, we're affordable housing advocates at New York Housing Conference. We've been focusing more on um, the budget to make sure we have um, capital support for affordable housing. We support expansion of rental assistance programs. And um, we've also focused on um, fair housing issues like source of income discrimination. So having you know achieved some wins along the way, 
um, you know, I'm kind of looking at, well, can we use our vouchers in New York City? Why are people, you know, taking a year to utilize our voucher or failing to utilize it at all? Because we don't have enough apartments. Um, on, you know, our homeless crisis, I, I think it's really the, the same thing of looking at um, people getting pushed out of housing because they have no housing choice, they can't afford their housing. And it, it does feel to me like housing supply um, is the next issue we will tackle in New York. There's an interesting interplay there between, you know, affordable housing uh, which we normally think of as that means like subsidized or it's part of inclusionary zoning that it's mandated to be at a certain level of affordability. But that that idea of affordable housing versus the idea of affordability generally, right, which is which is mostly a, a function of like supply and demand in that, you know, most New Yorkers, you know, 95 percent or whatever are, are not going to live in air quotes affordable units. They're just going to live in regular units, and we hope that they're affordable for them uh, because there's enough, and, and that's not the case right now. And uh, I guess you guys are – do you feel like your organization is in a place where you have to be advocating for both, for the the actual affordable units in the way we normally mean them, but then also uh, affordability generally? Yeah, I think it's both. I think to build – subsidized affordable housing, you need the zoning opportunities in New York City and across the state. And, you know, we're running out of those. Um, land costs are high. And if we're not unlocking some zoning opportunity, we have limited siting opportunities. So that's one issue. On the kind of general affordability, um, you know, I feel like the tenant advocates are just focused on expanding rights. But when you do that, those tenants are still fighting over the same limited number of apartments and dry competing with each other. And that's what's driving up rents. So if we have more housing, it's very clear to me that eventually um, we will see more affordability. Now, I don't think on the very um, lowest end of the income spectrum that there will be direct benefits. I still think we need to fight for additional rental assistance for the lowest income renters. But I do think um, when we can expand our housing supply, this will really boost choice for renters across New York City. And I think in the suburbs, we'll open up access for renters where there is none at all. Um, we have so many um, localities in the suburbs that are, you know, that are dominated by single family housing and you don't even have a multifamily housing option. So there are no apartments to rent or there are very few. But that um, price difference between owning a home and being able to rent one is huge and it's a big barrier right now and it's excluding um, a, a lot of New Yorkers from living where they want to live. Yeah, I was going to say, I think R Rachel also, you know, like um, helped publish a study on just looking at multifamily typologies and single family typologies in the suburbs as they are now. And you said, even if we don't bring rents down and we only build more housing at current prices, you can expect rents uh, to be able to, uh, you know, go down by double digits just because condos are more affordable than single family homes. So even if the aggregate level, just the fact that you're building more of the cheaper type that we already have, it, I, I, thought, I, thought, I, thought, I thought it was a great study where you're like, you know. Yeah, that's right. So in some of the suburban counties, it's a 40% difference um, in, you know, even in home ownership of owning a single family home versus a, a condo or co-op. Absolutely incredible. Like even if the aggregate level of home prices don't go down at all, Long Island become, could become 40% more affordable just if it had, you know, a substantial growth of those uh, condos that are already so much cheaper. Like I, I just think that's an incredible result and something that you can see really quickly. Um, and and of course, though, I agree with, with, with Rachel that like if you have zero market income, um, then, you know, there's no level of rent that you can afford. You know, there's this question of we, you need either income supports or, 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 or something like something public housing like where, where your rent is just is 30% of nothing, you know, 30% of zero income. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that like 
there, there's that different question there for people who have truly no market income. Um, but that, yeah, I, I don't know. I just think that like focusing on those nuts and bolts could be really powerful in, in persuading people, you know, this is real. We really could do this and make a big change uh, and, and soon. In terms of persuading people, I, th I think it's useful to kind of break down what the coalitions are right now. And so, you know, in the ways that we normally think about a political issue, we normally think, oh, well, the, the, the red team opposes this and the blue team is in favor. Um, or, or maybe in a, in a city like New York, it's, it's one kind of the moderate Democrats versus the very, very progressive Democrats or something like that. Um, you, sometimes we also think about this with housing as a geographical thing. It's it's the the legislators from Long Island versus the ones from the city. I, I'm curious if you see that kind of division. It, are there like party line breakdowns or ideological breakdowns or geographical breakdowns in terms of who's really support the most supportive of this kind of housing reform and who's really opposing it the most? Is there any kind of way to cleanly break that down? Uh, yes. So I uh, basically like Long Island was formed as a, a as a kind of in the suburban flight era of the 20th century. And so the the people who moved there are kind of sorted culturally against New York City. You know, if you if you walk around Nassau County, a common refrain you'll hear is, you know, this isn't Queens. You know, we don't want Queens people, we, you know, uh, and uh, and that, that creates something of a you know, that filtering of and the filtering and sorting basically does pose uh, a barrier if you're holding the election only in that one area. Now, that said, Long Island does still have voters still, uh, you know, desire, you know, housing affordability at a high level. Um, you know, the, the term is NIMBY, not in my backyard. It's always about the locality. The, the magic, the, the alchemy of, of YIMBYism at the state level is that everyone supports state level action? It's only just right next to them that that you get this opposition, um, and so that's that's one of the reasons why we you know really focused on the state level. But yes, so Long Island definitely um, Westchester has has moderated on this substantially, and I, I don't know if, if Rachel wanted to chime in on that, but yeah, basically Westchester has there have been some local cities, so like New Rochelle and White Plains have even taken local action to uh, to upzone before before state involvement. Um, now it's not perfect. Obviously, there was a fair housing lawsuit, uh, you know, under the Obama administration. It's not, you know, the county has its issues, but it's still in better shape, and and people seem to be much more open to uh, to you know to to addressing the problem in New York City proper. I think we do still have an issue of um, we we need to rebuild the growth machine, you know, to get we want the unions on board, we want uh, municipal employees on board, and we want. Um, uh, you know, affordable housing advocates, subsidized housing advocates all on board. And, uh, uh, and the tricky thing is how do you do that all while legalizing construction that's still pencils? So how do you do prevailing wage and an affordability mandate, both of which will not uh, make the housing really, really expensive? Um, and so navigating that, I think, is still going to, be, going to be difficult because we had people who supported mandatory inclusionary housing in New York City, for example, but then wanted to defund the program that funds it. So now we're getting no more MIH units because uh, people called to basically defund MIH. You know, that that's a that's a thing we're going to have to get uh, progressives on board with is like, you know, non-market housing needs funding for it to still pencil. Um, so we want to build this coalition, but we also want to make sure that the housing still eventually does get built. Yeah, I would just add that I think the real energy around housing is with the New York City progressives but it's around tenant rights. And some of those advocates and electeds are skeptical of supply. So I think that that is, um, you know, really something that we have to overcome. Um, and I also, you know, very strongly believe that tenant rights and adding housing supply are, you know, not um, issues that are to be countered, um, that they should be part of a, a broad housing agenda. But, um, you know, this, this tenant movement is really strong and, you know, they're just focusing on the tenant right expansion. And I think that really has had um, legislators' attention on the housing issues in Albany. So I think it's also, there's a lot of work to do just to, um, I think, 
you know, do outreach to electeds on the importance of adding housing supply. And then, um, you know, in the ways that kind of leverages that, um, I think, growing interest in Westchester that Alex mentioned um, and, and builds on some of that. But I think also for the New York City progressives, you know, thinking outside of just what's happening in their district and really thinking about this as a fair housing issue for New York State. Um, you know, I, I think that we haven't made the connection yet that if you're um, opposing housing in Long Island, that's also having an impact on rents in Brooklyn. So we have a lot of work to do to, you know, connect those dots and really show that exclusionary zoning across the region is hurting the whole region. That, that is so spot on. I just really wanted to highlight that again, what Rachel just said, that we are a regional labor market and a regional housing market. And in terms of how we got here, circling back to the beginning of our conversation, like New York City became really cheap as in the suburbs in the 1960s and 70s. We were building so fast in the suburbs. We were building faster than job growth. And we actually managed to drain the population of the city. You know, New York City's population fell by, by, by a million people in a single decade. Some of that was moving to suburbs and some of that was moving, you know, south. Um, but uh, uh, like we were able to create, even though New York City wasn't building much uh, housing in the core in those years, it became deeply affordable because we added so much supply in the suburbs. Now all those single family suburbs are built out. They've reached the maximum of their buy right zoning. Um, and so there's no more suburban supply and, and the city, you know, hasn't uh, since. So that's why the, you know, the 1961 down zoning took a long time for, for us to kind of hit the constraints. Cause it's like, there was a lot of, you know, uh, in, in the 1960s and 70s, there was still so much supply coming in the suburbs. So it wasn't until the eighties, nineties and, uh, and two thousands that, that the city really, you know, and the suburbs together really started, you know, falling short of, of, of what they needed to be building. I think another key key factor here is just um, for the electeds that you know tenant rights is their number one issue is also making the case that adding housing supply benefits the tenants over the landlords in those negotiations and coming back to you know where Manhattan was um, in you know that the starting in the spring of 2020. Um, tenants had the upper hand in negotiating rents, um, you know, upgrading their apartments, taking advantage of all the concessions landlords were offering because there were not enough tenants to fill the housing. Now, that was only happening on the, you know, high income end of the market. We still had really tight vacancy levels at the lowest end of the market. And that's why I think it's also important that we keep talking about solutions that are expanding supply and also um, adding more resources like rental assistance for those low income renters who aren't going to directly benefit in a timely manner. And it, it's, it's so it was so dramatic. I, I, I got to tell you, like what, what Rachel's saying, like in, in Manhattan, the percentage changes were largest because the, the shock, you know, the, the COVID shock was so focused on Manhattan, but also that the, what you might call the gentrification frontier pulled inwards sharply during that year. So I was living in Bushwick at the time and mid lease, just to encourage me to keep paying, my, my landlord offered uh, me a cut on a two bed from 2,400 to 1,800 mid lease. You know, truly extraordinary tenant power because vacancies were so high. And again, you know, that that kind of housing supply, uh, you know, uh, wall uh, where, you know, where rents are really high along the L train kind of pulled back from Bushwick back towards Williamsburg again, the way it had been 10 years ago. Um, and so uh, and so, yeah, it's like if you can build up in the core again, you can kind of soak up that gentrification that's pushed outwards. You could soak it back up into the middle. All those high income people can be drawn back just as happened during COVID. All right, so we're coming up on time soon, but before we get to the end, I want to ask both of you just in general, how optimistic are you that we can make something happen either in the next legislative session or or maybe in the next 2 years that there will be some sort of like major progress, not not oh we passed a little bill that maybe will help us add a thousand homes somewhere, but like something that will really actually move the market. How, how optimistic do you feel? I feel really optimistic that um, we are going to see state action on zoning. 
Um, I'm not sure I could predict it will happen this year or the next year, but I do think we are um, building momentum. We have a lot of work to do in coalition building, in outreach and, and education. Um, but I would also just point out that um, the politics here are also kind of, you know, bigger than um, just the seats in Albany. So New York lost, um, or the the Republicans in New York gained four um, seats in the House at the last congressional election. And, um, you know, we'll be in an election year next year. And I think that the New York Democrats are really thinking about how the housing message um, can hurt or help them in the suburbs where, um, you know, I think the seats are, um, you know, the Democrats have potential to gain back seats in Long Island or the Hudson Valley. So I think that is going to be part of the calculation um, for how Albany thinks about how far they're willing to push on housing this year, how far they're willing to push um, Hudson Valley, Westchester, and Long Island electives locally. Oh, yeah, I'll echo that. It, and it relates to the structural stuff we were talking about before. New York's swing suburbs are the New York City suburbs. You know, upstate's more conservative, uh, you know, with with kind of the big blue, with some big blue cities. Um, and then, and then of course, there's, you know, New York City is big blue, and then we have, you know, redder suburbs. And uh, so, like, because those are the swing districts, you 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 want to be careful with, you know, how you... Um, uh, you know, what the turnout effects of various policies you you propose are. So again, like you said, uh, that in Montana, there are more libertarian Republicans. And in Long Island, there's more kind of national conservative style, uh, like not as interested in the economic freedom side of conservatism. And so you, uh, you right, you basically that you want to you know, pay close attention to, uh, to you know, to those dynamics uh, in, in the election timing. But um you know, otherwise, I do think it's possible that we'll get some some medium size reform. I'm not expecting a compact size reform to go through, but I think we will make some incremental progress, and that we'll we'll open things up for uh, you know smoother sailing in future years. All right. Well, we are coming up on time now, so I want to ask the traditional final question that we always ask on this podcast, and that is, where can people go to learn more? if they're interested specifically in, in New York's housing crisis and what's being done about it? Are there particular organizations that, uh, that they should follow? Are there people to follow on Twitter? Are there blogs, books, uh, reporters, et cetera? Just anything that you think would be helpful for people who want to understand this. And, and obviously, uh, Rachel will, will, will uh, say that people should pay attention to the, uh, the New York Housing Compact um, and, and obviously the work that the Niskanen Center is doing. So I'll, I'll be happy to throw those out there. <laughs> sure. So follow, uh, the New York housing conference. Um, our A handle conference. is T H E N Y H C, um, on Twitter, um, or whatever it's called these days. And, um, you know, some other groups that I think are really, um, doing great work and very relevant open New York is building chapters, um, across New York state. Um, they're a grassroots YIMBY group. The Regional Planning Association in New York does a lot of great policy papers on our um, regional needs, um, housing and zoning in particular, and have been leading a New York Neighbors Coalition that we've been part of. So if you have an organization in New York that would like to join New York Neighbors, there's an opportunity there. So the Zoning Atlas Project is um, mapping zoning across New York State, and I expect that they will produce some public maps in the autumn, which is really exciting. The NYU Furman Center um, tackles a whole host of um, housing issues. Um, they're also a great resource on land use and um, all of the policy issues that will be um, coming up at the state this year. Um, and our, our local journalists on housing, I think, are do an amazing job. They're so well-versed and, um, you know, I think do really great local work on the issue. Um, Errol Lewis, Mara Gay, Emma Whitford, Ben Max, Mahir Zaveri, Greg David, David Brand, John Chada, Sam Mellons, um, all folks to follow on Twitter. Um, 
I'm sure Alex has more to add. Oh, I'm Rachel. I'm stunned. Declarative memory is usually not supposed to be that easy. You really had your list. That's very impressive. Uh, I would endorse all of those and excellent journalist choices. We're we're very we're blessed to have great local media. And then the New York Times has come around on this. The New York Times has been very good on uh, on housing coverage of late, um, and that's just been wonderful to see. Um, uh, and the um, I, I would add, uh, oh, Citizens Budget Commission of New York also does some good housing work. Uh, uh, Sean over there does a, you know, Sean Campion does some, has done some nice research. I would specifically also point you to Rachel's study of the suburbs, like 40% cheaper homes from building condos. Very counterintuitive to a lot of New Yorkers. If you're interested, definitely take a look at that one. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, that's like Furman, uh, Furman has, the Furman Center has so many, um, so many great researchers, including uh, Ingrid Gould Allen and Vicki Bean. And um, they've, they've really, they've been doing just producing a lot of great work. Um, you, Mark Willis, so many great, uh, uh, great resources here. We just, we're so excited to, you know, get them all, get them all together. And I would just add also, um, you know, we haven't talked about the migrant crisis and the impact on New York, but it's also, um, you know, a, an issue of major concern for New Yorkers and a humanitarian tragedy at our doorstep. And I think um, homelessness is a housing problem by Greg Colburn and um, Clayton Page Aldern is like a great way to understand um, why we need to build more housing um, to introduce housing stability across the city. Absolutely. I mean, I think the the migrant thing, you know, it, it's it's sad that an immigrant center like New York City, which is built off immigration you know, and, and you talk about Ellis Island and you talk about all the different peoples we have from all over the world living in New York City. And the fact that like the federal government is basically telling migrants don't go to New York City because you mm -hmm. can't afford it there because there's no housing. You know, New York City is not migrant friendly because no one can get an affordable apartment there. And so you will not thrive there. And like people, they're, they're straight up saying that about New York City and like official mm -hmm. documents. And it's, it's a shame given the city's history and, and what we could be. So right. Ellis Island used to process double the number of you know migrants per year that we've received for this entire year, year. But the thing is that there's the federal element of that too, that if you have uh, federal permission to work, then, you know, we can, we can get cooking. But yeah, in the, in the meantime, housing wise, you know, that, that poem, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Turns out that, you know, North Jersey is the golden door, not New York anymore in terms of actual housing construction. And we'll close on that note that we cannot allow New York to be beaten by Jersey. That's shameful in anything. So um, on that note, I hope we see a lot of progress over the next couple of years. I want to say thank you to my guests, Alex, Rachel. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks. Pleasure.